Hello, and welcome to the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. I'm Mark Lewis, Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And on this episode, my guest is one of our very own research uh, uh, fellows at uh, ETI, uh, Jacob Wynn. Um, so today's podcast is going to focus on Jacob's upcoming white paper, which analyzes how the Department of Defense funds its science and technology portfolio. Uh, and of course, as always, please visit our website and YouTube pages to do follow up after this conversation to see these activities and, of course, more of the things that we do at ETI. So let me tell you a little bit about Jacob and his background before we dive into the paper. And Jacob studied international affairs at George Washington University, where he was selected as the recipient of his graduating class of the Elliott School of International Affairs Distinguished Scholar Award. Uh, during his time at George Washington, he also spent time interning, interning with the House Energy and Commerce Committee, as well as the lab at OPM as part of the Call to Serve program. Uh, Jacob started out in the strategy and policy team at NDIA, and after we saw his great work there on intellectual property policy, CMMC, and the DOD's PPPE process, uh, we were fortunate enough to bring him onto our team. Basically, we stole him from our colleagues in another part of NDIA, <laughs> and he hasn't looked back. Um, Jacob's been working on this in, the, in this area of uh, S&T funding uh, with Carrie Shearer, one of our other outstanding early career researchers, and they have drawn what I think are some fascinating conclusions. So first, Jacob... Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast, and let me thank our audience for joining us and listening what, to what you and I are going to have to say today. Yeah, thank you for having me, and thank you for the introduction. So, so, so Jacob, I want to dive right in, all right? So what is it that led you to you know, suggest that we do this project, Analyzing Defense Science and Technology Investments? Yeah, so uh, we started this project because we saw a need for better information for all of ETI's work on what DoD actually funds and where it puts its dollars to see what the priorities were for the department. Um, so we found with some of the other work that we didn't have many of those quantitative stats on hand at the specific program element level or you know, really too much under the surface. And we weren't really sure how things changed over time with other strategic guidelines that the Department of Defense has put out over time. So we started looking to see if uh, there were any other analyses out there because most of the data is public access and found a pretty incomplete picture, which was compounded by the fact that when you dig into what the Pentagon really asks for each year and what Congress appropriates in all of the little details that there are for that, they're spread out over a lot of documents uh, that are with the Pentagon or with Congress. Uh, many of which aren't in Excel, and a lot of them, unfortunately, are not machine readable either. Um, so that led us so, to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I think that's an excellent point. You know, some of our listeners might think, well, wait, that's easy. You know, just look at the spreadsheet, see where S and T is, and in fact, it's an extremely complicated thing to to decipher. Yeah, it's uh, it's an extremely complicated pot of money because it goes to, from a lot of different places. Uh, within the department to a lot of different performers. And then it's broken down very rigidly across various budget activities that you can try your best to track. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And as you say, it's it's not easy Excel spreadsheets. In some cases, you are pouring through old documents, PDF documents, exactly. trying to figure out what's S&T, what isn't. And, and I got to tell you, I, 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 one of the things that, that, that I loved about this project was, you know, when I was in government, if you'd asked me what was the overall s and I couldn't have answered the question. We didn't have all this information, uh, you know, at hand. I could have estimated it. I could have asked the various offices. But having this together in one location, being able to draw these conclusions, uh, I thought was absolutely wonderful. So that, that gets us to, to, you know, explain to our audience, and it's almost self-evident, but I'd like you to give us your clear explanation. Why is consistent funding in science technology important? It's a great question. Uh, clear and consistent funding for S&T is important because you can't just give a burst of funding to the S&T ecosystem and expect results. You can't just put it in the oven and get your finished good out on the other side. Uh, research is a multi-year process. Uh, to get the outcomes you need, you have to engage in a multi-year process. So the performers of all of the research, depending on if it's basic research or applied research or, or, or what have you, they need to know that they're going to get funding for the next year in order to retain their workforce, in order to retain their facilities, uh, to keep their current work while continuing to apply to more grants. And, you know, you can't expect that uh, an innovation that you fund in fiscal year 23 is going to come in 24. 
that might be an effort that you find needs three more years. And if, if you can't reliably know that that funding is going to come, it can cause a lot of problems. So the S&T ecosystem looks for that consistency as a signal that they can keep performing the good work that they do. I, and I think those are excellent points. You know, I'll just give as one example. In my own field of hypersonics, the idea of a supersonic combustion ramjet, the jet engine we view as the, the propulsion system of choice for flying at high speeds in the atmosphere. The first, first paper that really spelled out how that type of engine would work was written in 1957. And it took 44 more years for us to actually fly a working version yeah. of that engine. So sometimes these are long-term investments. Uh, if, if I can, there's also there's the workforce issue because mm-hmm. a lot of our S&T dollars are, go, are not spent in the department. They're spent outside, not only at companies, but at universities. We're funding graduate students, master's, PhD students, sometimes undergraduate students. And you know, especially in, at the graduate student level, they need the consistent funding to make sure that they graduate. And if you, you, know, you cancel funding, you do starts and stops, university programs go through starts and stops, and that has a direct impact on students. It also has a direct impact on workforce. Exactly, because the people who perform basic research at the universities now and need that funding are eventually going to go to the workforce and they're going to get another potentially pot of money down the line later in their careers to be performing on an industry applied research contract or something like that. So for everything to flow, it requires that type of consistency all the way through the process. Absolutely. Okay, so now let's dive dive into the meat of it. So first... What is the DoD science and technology budget portfolio? So, so what does it fund? What's it for? What does it include? Uh, many members of our listening audience probably have an idea, but again, it would be great. Let's, let's just kind of spell it out. Yeah, absolutely. So the science and technology portfolio is a really massive set of programs all across DoD in the military services. Uh, last year, Congress appropriated about $23 billion for it. Uh, And this year, the request is about $17 billion, and most people think that Congress is going to give it even more money. Uh, It's a vital component of the U.S. maintaining its technological advantage over potential adversaries. The idea is that if you're funding research into tomorrow's capabilities today, you're well on your way towards preserving your ability to be a step ahead uh, in terms of what you're fielding uh, with near-peer conflicts, uh, or, or really any other conflict, but always being very forward looking like that. Um, it can be broken down into three pots uh, across the R&D research and development process. So you've got uh, the first kind of pot is basic research. Uh, that's really about the fundamental properties of science, making sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're driving general science that might have a military application someday. So you can imagine funding material science Uh, and having a development in material science be really important for something like hypersonics down the line. Uh, But we might not even know what it's for yet. Um, Then you have the applied research, which is when someone in the military has said, okay, we've got this need. Uh, We think we're going to need to do some research to get there. Uh, So we're basically going to field a request for some type of research performer to get us a little bit closer to that goal. Uh, And then the last part of what people think of as the S&T portfolio is the first part of development, the earliest part of development, where you have some type of promising discovery in the lab. Uh, You're starting to not quite prototype it, but at least show a proof of concept that there's something to it uh, that might lead towards some type of contract or military system someday. So it's sort of a pipeline, but there's a bit of a less linear route that something might go from idea all the way into a capability for the military. And, you know, I love the fact that you pointed out that it can be a nonlinear route. And, and you know, often I run into the, the mis- I, what I think is the mistaken idea that research goes first it starts 6-1, then it goes 6-2, then it goes 6-3. Exactly. And, and in fact, it's not what happens. That, that often, you know, you, you start to apply something and you realize, oh, we've run across a, a, a roadblock and we need to understand this more. You go back and you do 6-1 and you think through the problem. You know, material science is a great example. I might be building something and I realize, oh, I don't have the right material. The material that I thought would work isn't going to work. I go back to uh, 6-1. And so it's, it's this back and, and forth. And I, and I love the fact that, again, in your study, you, 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 you kept that in mind. Also worth pointing out that uh, you know, a, a lot of the six one dollars go out of the department. They go to universities and other types of organizations. Um, services usually shoot for about seventy percent outside, thirty percent inside. 
So, uh, you know, back back to the point about about workforce. So so okay. So with that in mind, tell us a little bit about what you actually did. What was your what was your research process? And then we're going to dive into the takeaways. Yep, definitely. So this was definitely at first an exercise of figuring out what we could actually do because, like we talked about before, okay. a lot of the documents are siloed. Um, some of them are machine readable and some of them are not, but we were trying to see what type of lift we could take on. So a lot of the exercise was gathering the data, figuring out what was out there and figuring out how we could use it. So to do that, uh, we divided the 21st century into what we described as five strategic eras. Uh, those were the, uh, Iraq war operation, Iraqi freedom, the budget control act the Obama administration's third offset, and then the two national defense strategies. So Trump's 2018 national defense strategy, and then President Biden's 2022 national defense strategy. And we wanted to look at how the funding has changed and what DOD asks for over time, uh, over those five periods of time to see if we could kind of glean whether or not those uh, strategic eras had any influence on what DOD actually asks Congress for every year or what Congress decides to give it. Uh, so a lot of our work was juxtaposing those requested numbers from the department up against the appropriated numbers from Congress. But not only that, also looking at how treating it for inflation affected things uh, and also looking at how uh, the different budget activities compared to each other over time. Excellent. So, OK, we're going to cut to the chase. You know, in DOD parlance, we talk bluff, bottom line up front. Yep. So let's talk bottom line up front. What were your biggest takeaways? Yep. So I think the first biggest takeaway that we could go into is that the s and budget is actually remarkably stable uh, in what uh, the Department of Defense asks for in inflation adjusted terms. Uh, pretty much from 2003 up until around 2021, when it started to really shoot up more than it had before. Uh, it's been about $15 billion uh, in inflation adjusted terms since uh, since 2003. Uh, there was a little bit of a lead up before that, uh, after 9-11 and during the anthrax attacks, but it really has been remarkable how across different parties, different administrations, uh, different strategic guidelines, it, uh, we really have remained pretty consistent over time. Interesting, interesting. And, you know, reassuring gets back to one of the earlier points you make that consistency is important. And so we've seen that. Okay, so you mentioned some takeaways about Congress's appropriations. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, exactly. So the remarkable thing about s and appropriations is that Congress, no matter what, always gives DOD more funding than whatever it asked for. <laughs> uh, and that's true for yeah. all three budget activities. But what it means is that for s and as a whole, it is always better supported. However, uh, that uh, increase in appropriation is a bit less consistent than what the department requests. Sometimes Congress decides to give way more during the request. And then what we found is that uh, Congress really didn't give much more at all during all of the sequestration efforts of 2013 related to the BCA. Uh, and uh, there was a, a period of time when President Obama and Speaker Boehner had put in a moratorium on member-directed spending. So you can really see that you know, there's there was a lower expectation of the dollars of what uh, universities and industry could actually expect to get as the, as that got closer to the request again. But then, more recently, as the BCA has lifted, uh, what you're really seeing budget is, control yes, act the budget yeah. control act. Uh, yeah. You're really yeah. seeing that uh, the amount of money that Congress is appropriating has really begun to be way more than DoD asks asks for in its wildest dreams. <laughs> Yeah. And of course, I, mean, I hate to say it, but the DOD knows that. So they, it, it, it can lead to this vicious, vicious cycle of I request less because I know I'm going to get more. Yeah, there's there's possibly yeah. something to that. And then there's also the fact that as a whole, we found that the the broader uh, pot of money that uh, S&T is a part of called the Research Development Test and Evaluation title, that title, which is really big, it's right now about $140 billion, has grown significantly over the past 20 years. Uh, but it's it's really grown by close to 50% over just the past five years. And it could be a rising tide raises all boats situation where uh, you're seeing, you know, Congress really start to open up what it's willing to fund because it's, it's putting a broader emphasis on uh, uh, research and development over time as well. But we'll talk about some of the reasons that might be. Yeah. Okay. So, so 
on, on the theme of consistency, um, we often hear that the target for S&T funding is 3% of the DOD top line. So how well have we delivered 3% of the DOD top line? It's a great question. Uh, yeah. So to back up, the 3% of top line guideline that analysts talk about a lot isn't written in stone. Uh, it comes out of the late 90s, early 2000s. A lot of analysts and reports that the department had commissioned recommending that DOD act more like commercial industry in that commercial industry uh, tends to spend about 3% of its expenditures on its future. Uh, so that was the idea behind the 3% goal. Uh, there is a there there is a goal across the services and across the Department of Defense that they will meet that 3% goal. What we found is that at no year in, at, at, in any year uh, since 2001, the, the, the time we looked at, has DOD actually requested 3% of that goal. Uh, they got close in a couple of years, but uh, for the most part, they have not hit that number. Interest. By the way, which years did they get close? They got the they they got the closest that uh, they got the closest from around 2001 to 2007. And they got really close in 2007, and you can you know you see the op tempo increase in places like Iraq, places like Afghanistan. Uh, so you 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 can see the investments there, but then really quickly, as soon as the BCA comes out, Budget Control Act. Uh, you just see it fall lower than two percent, even uh, in terms of what DoD is asking for. So, so more recently, it's been ticking back up again. It's actually pretty close these last two years, fiscal year twenty two and twenty three, and now twenty four. The request has been a uh, little over two point five percent, but they're not quite hitting it. Um, but part of the reason that might be is because Congress year over year uh, has been getting DoD closer. To that number in terms of what's actually appropriated for them to operate. So there could be something to the fact that they know that Congress is likely to come in, add a little bit more money for 6-1 and 6-2, regardless of who the president is, regardless of who is in Congress, and, and that gets you a little bit closer. Um, until 2007, Congress actually was getting DOD to that 3% goal. Uh, but since then, it hasn't happened. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, so by the way, I, is, is it really important that we get to the 3% so, top line goal? It's a good question. Um, I I think it's fairly important that you try to get close to something approaching that if that's what commercial industry is doing and, and they're hitting a serious tempo of innovation. Um, you could argue, on the other hand, that, you know, like like I said, the, the inflation adjusted level of S&T has been really good and consistent. And it's possible that that's the amount of money that the S&T ecosystem can absorb. Um, it could, I mean, and there is an argument to be said that you don't want to try to chase the top line of, of the whole defense department up and down one year, give it, you know, 3% one year might mean $20 billion and 3% the next year might mean $12 billion. And that would be pretty bad for investment decisions. So well, hopefully, hopefully not, hopefully not yeah, that hopefully big a swing, that, yeah, I get hopefully you, I get not you. that big a swing, yeah. but it, 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 it could swing quite a bit and, you know, 10, 15, 20% swings could hurt the ecosystem. So, but I, absolutely. Ideally, they get close to it. Absolutely, absolutely. I've always made the argument also that you want a percentage goal as a line in the sand. Exactly. So you can argue should it be three percent, two and a half percent, three and a half percent. You can go through all those arguments, but what's more important is you've got a consistent line, and so you can measure against it, which you've done, and you can tell if you're, you know, if you're if you're dropping your commitment. So, okay, you mentioned that S and T funding has crept up as U.S. strategic planning has pivoted towards Asia, and especially with the ND, uh, NDS 2018 National Defense Strategy and the National Defense Strategy that came out in 22, again, emphasized a you know, pivot towards Asia, peer competition. So could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, so it definitely seems like things are changing. Uh, like I said, throughout the you know late 2000s, early 2010s, you're really seeing things stay pretty flat. Uh, there's a pretty consistent op tempo around the world. Uh, around 2014, you see... Uh, the start of a pivot to Asia, so to speak, language come out of the Obama administration. Uh, you see this third offset part, uh, third offset policy come out of the of the uh, Obama administration. What you don't see too much, though, with that third offset strategy is a change in what they're requesting for S and T yet. But you're at least starting to see some interest in the strategic documents. By the time you get to the 2018 National Defense Strategy, a lot of policymakers in Congress 
in DOD have begun to sound the alarm about China as the pacing challenge. Uh, they, they've begun to talk more about the need to move away from the global war on terror mindset and back towards that great power conflict. Uh, so around the time of the 2018 NDS, you're starting to see real growth in the S&T portfolio, uh, I, probably driven by concerns that China has made a lot of investments in its S&T community. Uh, they've gotten closer to us in technology. Uh, and since then, on a bipartisan basis, you've really only seen that accelerate. Uh, uh, the Biden administration team took the 2018 national defense strategy, used a lot of it, um, and have continued to fund S&T at a bit of a higher level in pursuit of those changing goals, trying to invest more and more in the 2030, 2040 time period. And of course, I'm going to admit to a little bit of a bias, but the fact that, you know, you saw the creation of the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, emphasizing research and engineering, uh, you, you, you made a point of that, you know, there, there's bipartisan support for S&T. And I, I think that was also an interesting inclusion that you got. No one party owns 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 S and T that both parties have actually done pretty well in in, in standing up for exactly. it. Exactly. Uh both parties have done a good job of standing up for it. Uh they they they've always provided uh more money than what DOD has said they need to achieve that mission. Uh probably to the benefit of the war fight, to be honest. Um more more investment goes further. There there are some great capabilities. Now you see um new line items uh, in the s and portfolio, but also later in that RDT and E title, uh, trying to transition technologies more quickly. Um, we'll be following those here at ETI to see how successful they are. We'll try to grade them, but it is encouraging to see that there's bigger numbers in terms of what is being funded for s and combined with efforts to get it fielded a bit faster. I'm thinking of things like Raider, uh, talking about that. Right. Office of Strategic yeah. Capital, yeah, of strategic other- capital. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, what's next? Where, where, where do you envision the project going? Yeah, so I think what's next, uh, we're really happy with what we were able to learn so far, but we're aware that we've pretty much scratched the surface of what you could know just by, really, we've just been looking at some trend lines and, and trying to put them in context of of what's happened over the 21st century in terms of policy guidance from DOD and, and where Congress has been at in terms of its collective thinking. So I think what's next for us is going a bit more uh, under the hood. We're, we're trying to work on the back end on a capability to track some more details uh, about the budget and appropriation data. Um, so it, basically, in order for us to go a bit more under the hood, look into uh, specific programs a bit more, how those have changed over time, maybe even follow dollars from uh, over time as they've gone from basic research out towards a uh, contract for a capability later on, if we could find a way to do it. Um, there's some more quantitative ways that we could try to look at DOD reprogrammings or trying to add out uh, how much Congress earmarks for different things, Try really distribute those uh, to the NDIA membership, uh, to other interested think tanks, and, 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 and then to fuel our own work as well. Uh, in the nearer term, though, I think our I think our next step will probably be to start looking more into the services, doing what we've done here, but really trying to tell a story of how has the army gone about modernizing over the 21st century? How has the Navy gone about modernizing? Trying to figure out what's worked and what hasn't there as well, and, and, and how that flows down to the actual money at the end of the day. And we've got a really neat opportunity with the Space Force being absolutely so new, right? Absolutely. Right? Seeing as they stand up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, so you get to see, yeah, especially for the Space Force, hopefully we'll get to see how the Space Force is doing, um, where they've put money, maybe even track what programs they inherited from the Air Force, things like the Space Development Agency, uh, and see how things like that begin to work out over the next few years as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, Jacob, first, thank you so much for this work that you and Carrie have been doing. I, it's, it's, I know it's been a labor of love. I've been watching you as you've been digging through, but we've you know, all, all of us at ETI have, have, have enjoyed as the conclusions are rolling out and as the trend lines are rolling out, and, and we've been enjoying these ro robust discussions. Um, uh, th thank you for being uh, with us on this podcast. Uh, let me thank our audience for tuning in. Um, I want to take a moment, if I could, to highlight uh, that first, Jacob will be producing a report based on what he's found, full of data and information and charts that will capture some of the trends that he talked about. Um, I also want to point out to our audience 
that we will have our upcoming Emerging Technologies for Defense Conference and Exhibition. Uh, that'll be held at the JW Marriott Hotel this summer, 2023, between, uh, from August 28th until August 30th. And please look for more information about Jacob and Carrie's work, and also look for more information about our conference on our website very, very soon. Again, thank you very much for joining us, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.